In this video we're going to have a look at dynamic memory allocation within C++. Just explore some of the, the aspects about how it operates, how we can visualize what's happening, and a few of the things we want to be uh, aware about. As a reminder, demand, uh, dynamic memory allocation is of use whenever we need to allocate memory at runtime. Um, because maybe we don't know the size of it or it's a sufficient uh, overall volume, we need to, to package it up in different ways. It's memory that's allocated on the heap and uh, generally speaking is, is, is intended, when we're talking here about dynamic allocation, we're not talking about local variables and things like that, we are more or less talking about data that we want to create that will persist for a while and we'll be able to use it to, to one end or another. So the heap is where this data notionally will live the new keyword is the way whereby we will be able to allocate it. And alongside that, we also have the, the delete uh, keyword as well. And that gives us an ability to free things up that whenever we have decided that we've used it and it's, it's, uh, we don't need to use it anymore, we should free up the memory using the delete keyword. So then it's available again to our program if it needs to allocate um, some more uh, new or additional memory. The general form of allocating new memory, you can see here. Uh, so at the top, we've got the new. We're creating a new, and we say the type of data that we're creating. So we need that because the type of the data that we're creating determines the number of bytes that we need to allocate on the heap to hold that piece of data. Uh, and what we get back from the new keyword is a pointer to the thing that we have allocated, whereabouts it lives or notionally resides on the heap. So again, we've got a pointer to whatever type it is, that's the return, we can then use it having done so. So you can see a couple of examples underneath that. Uh, one, we're creating a new integer, other one, we're creating a new double, but creating the double as well as initializing the, the memory. That's important. Whenever we go to the heap and we ask, give us a chunk of memory from it, it'll come along with some ones and zeros in terms of whatever the default memory was as part of the allocation. If it's important to us, it has certain starting values. We, as the programmer, need to make sure we do that initialization or that um, setup. But at the bottom, if there's insufficient spa free space to allocate the data item, you'll get an out of memory exception. And that will happen if, if we're pushing the heap up and it collides into the stack. All of our free memory has been exhausted. The program can't continue, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll generate an exception at that point. Um, the delete keyboard, as we mentioned, it is our ability to free these things up, and it is important that we uh, always pair a, a delete with an allocation of, of memory. Uh, the delete keyboard operates, we give it a pointer itself, and it'll be a pointer to something on the heap. Uh, and generally, the garbage, uh, the, garbage the, the memory management system will, will have a table of things that are allocated, it'll know where things reside on it. But using that, we can then free up things that reside on the, the heap. Key thing to note in this, we're just releasing memory, we're freeing it up from the heap. Um, our pointer variable still exists, it'll still have a value that points to the heap, but now it's known as a dangling pointer. It points to an area of memory that notionally is not restricted anymore. It could be sent and allocated for something else. So you have to be very careful when you do delete something with a pointer you either want to null that pointer, set it to zero, or, or discard the things. You don't inadvertently access or manipulate memory that, that now is up for anybody to grab. Um, always balance a new with the delete for you to do so. If you don't do that, we have a memory leak. I'm going to show you a few examples which will illustrate the types of scenario where leaks, maybe inadvertently, uh, get introduced. But to do that, or by way of getting at that, we're going to have a short aside in terms of visualization of, of memory. So it's, I mean, this is, this is straightforward, it's not complicated. Um, this particular screen here at the bottom, you can see we're creating an integer value uh, equal to three. And we can visualize that by saying we have a box, that's our memory. The contents of that box is, is the value of that integer three, and we've got our val next to it in terms of the, the particular label that we've associated with that chunk and that block of of memory. So we can think of that as, as a way of visualizing um, memory. So reasonably straightforward. 
give you an illustration then of this and here we're breaking things down across the stack and across the heap by way of whereabouts that allocated memory resides. Got a mythical foo. At line three, we're saying we've got an integer pointer, PTR int, is equal to new int. Now, what happens when that gets to be executed is visualized then on the right hand side of the screen. We've got an integer pointer, so PTR int. So whenever that block is entered, we will allocate sufficient memory to hold that integer pointer. So if we're dealing with 30-bit pointer, it's four bytes of memory. It's an automatic variable, so it's created on the stack. So our stack pointer will be incremented by four. That area um, that we've just reserved, we will refer to it as then PTR int. So we have a pointer's size chunk of memory set aside on the stack, um, that, which we're referring to as PTR int. Now, on entry to the block, we'll do that allocation. It'll contain a value, but that value won't have been assigned to anything initially. By way of executing line three, so PDR int will come into scope. We'll call the new int method. So the new method will result in our memory allocation algorithms firing off. They'll go to the heap. They will find, one hopes, um, four bytes of a 32-bit integer, which will then be set aside and reserved for that. So we allocate those four bytes on the heap and we return a pointer. And that pointer then is assigned to the pointer variable on the stack. So you can see what it looks like. We've got PTR int, that lives on the stack. The value of that pointer variable is the address on the heap where our integer was created. And as of this point in time, the, the contents of the integer, there'll be some, some content there to it in terms of having allocated it but we haven't initialized it, so we can't make any assumptions about what that content is. And if we wanted to access the heap, then it's the dereferenced PTR int that refers to the chunk of memory that resides on the, the heap. So, so far, so good. It's reasonably straightforward, simple realization uh, of it, but it's useful to think in terms of the, the data that we allocate, uh, where it lives, how we're linking it uh, together. By way of a, if it's a slightly more sophisticated example, here we're making use of a pointer to a pointer. And you can have as many pointers to pointers to pointers to pointers as you want to, to, to have. In this case, it's just a pointer to another pointer. Um, so in this case, in line three, we are declaring an int star star. So that is a pointer that points to uh, an integer pointer. So we're pointing to something that itself points to an integer. So it's a second level of direction. Why might you need that? If you have a multi-dimensional array where you have sort of rows and columns and you want to sort of step through those, a pointer to a pointer is a very nice way of being able to, to access multiple uh, rows and columns within that two-dimensional um, array. So going into this here at the start of the block line two, we'll create index, that is uh, our pointer to a pointer, uh, to an int which resides on the stack. So there we have index being created on the stack uh, and called as such. In line three, we will use the first of our new keywords. Uh, so we're going off to the heap. We're allocating sufficient memory to hold an integer pointer. So let's assume 32-bit uh, system, four bytes. So an integer pointer is created on the heap. Contents, we don't know what the point of creation at line three, uh, but we'll return the address of that integer pointer and that is then assigned to index or pointer to an integer pointer. On line four, we're using the new keyword again. So in this sense, we're creating just an int. So again, on our heap, next bit down towards the bottom, we allocate another chunk of memory sufficient to hold an integer. And we are assigning that to asterisk index, which is the dereferenced index. So if we dereference index and dereference it once, we get a pointer to an integer. So the pointer to integer, which happens to live in the heap in terms of where that pointer variable is, we update the ones and the zeros that represent that pointer integer so that it now holds the address of the new integer that we have also created on the heap. So we link it together as such. And you can see down at the bottom, we have star star index, which is the dereferenced, dereferenced pointer to pointer to an int. So you can have as many of these up and down as, as you want, and it can get a little bit complicated, but it shows some of the power of, of pointers in terms of our ability to step through, particularly multi-dimensional um, systems. But 
useful, like I said, to be able to understand and, and to visualize uh, where our data is, is defined, where it's structured, particularly when we come to stepping through this, when we come to cleaning it up to make sure we've managed to remove all elements of it. Uh, here's an example of where we're going to orphan uh, some memory, put in a memory leak. I've uh, got our foo method, not a great example this time. Uh, line three, we're creating a new int, which lives in the heap. We're linking it into an integer pointer, it lives in the stack. You can see this at the top. Line four, we're creating a new int. We're, we'll get a pointer back, but we're not assigning it to anything. So in this sense, we're just allocating memory in the heap and we're immediately losing our understanding or our knowledge of where that was allocated. So line four automatically wastes memory, it's gone. In line five, we're exiting out of the block, which means that our stack then will get to be cleared up, but we didn't delete the integer that we created. So whenever foo finishes, we'll have the example at the bottom. A stack is being reset back to, to a starting point, but the heap now has two integers which have been allocated. They're still sitting there, uh, but we've lost our ability to access them, to, to know about them because the pointers that we did have, either we ignored on the return or we then discarded whenever the method ended. So that's orphaned memory, it's wasted memory. We can never get it back. And if we call foo frequently, we'll keep on doing that and eventually we'll run out of memory. Um, a few other examples. I'll, I'll do a bit at the bottom and then I'll show you the, the example in terms of the code. So delete releases memory allocated using you. Fair enough. Once deleted, the allocated pointer becomes a dangling pointer. So it's still a pointer variable. It still has a value. It just now points to something that is now free, shouldn't be used, dangerous to use it. Um, General advice do that is you null the pointer after deleting anything. So then you, you can't accidentally do. You can test to see if the pointer is null and if need be, you know, don't, don't do anything. There's other ways you can get dangling pointers coming about that, that are maybe not so obvious. This is an illustration of the example. So we got a method foo. In this case, it's returning an integer pointer. So foo returns a pointer to an integer. In line three, we're creating val. Uh, line four, we're working out some value for val, and on line five, we're returning the address of val. So we are returning a pointer to val, the value that we've worked out. And foo normally says, okay, fair enough, yeah, that's, that's I've calculated it, there you go, there's a pointer to the result. The problem with the implementation of foo at the minute is that in line three, the data that we create lives on the stack. So we're creating val on the stack. Uh, we're updating the value on the stack. Whenever foo finishes, we clean up the stack. We then basically free up the memory that before had been allocated and reserved for val. It's now not reserved for val. So the example below, line one, two, and three, uh, towards the middle of the slide, shows you a problem. In line one, we call foo. Uh, we get our integer pointer back. Brilliant. And maybe if I printed it out at this point or I tested it, it would have an expected value, perfectly normal value. If I ever in line two, I call some other function. And I'm assuming this function will have its own automatic variables. It may call other methods or whatever. It changes the stack. It adds its bits to the stack. So the pointer that I had to val in line one was pointing to memory that notionally was free, that other function probably will have been given access to and will have used and overwritten and manipulated. So down at line three, I access val, but again, I'm still accessing a piece of memory that I shouldn't be accessing. It's been changed probably since the function was called and, and you'll end up with a not a nice situation, a nasty situation to be in. So we need to be careful, usual thing about using pointers that we're certain what they point to, that it's still valid, that it's still in scope, that it hasn't been modified, all of those different things. Dynamic arrays uh, then, so have a look at, um, at use of arrays being created on the heap. Um, the examples I've, I've given so far have been using new for creating ints and things like that. It's too small a quantity of data to create. Uh, normally if we're creating something new it's because we're creating reasonably chunky, reasonably meaty, big pieces of data. Uh, could be objects, could be arrays of primitives, whatever you want to do. Uh, but new typically used for creating large uh, or, or sizable chunks of, of data. If you know the size, if you have to create an array and you know the size of a runtime, you do have the option of statically creating it if you wish to. 
If you don't know the size, then it has to be dynamically created, which means at runtime. So in this case, we, we have to use the new keyword, have to allocate it then on the heap if we want to retain this information from between calls and things like that. Uh, how do we do this? It's, it's very straightforward, as you might expect. This is almost too trivial uh, a slide. Um, so again, uh, the code example towards the top, we're creating a new type name and inside brackets we're given the size of it. So we're creating an array of that particular type. It'll reserve sufficient storage for, for uh, depending on how many size items that we ask for. We'll get that. You can see an example of the stack in the heap for an array of size 5 um, as being created. And we get a pointer back to the start of that array. So much, so good. Very obvious, very straightforward. Now, something that it's a little bit more problematic. Um, bring good programmers. We create something new. We'll delete it later on. We have to be careful if we want to free up an array. Um, there's a different form used if you want to free up an array as opposed to freeing up a value within it. So you can see the syntax there. We've got to delete and put in our brackets, square brackets, to indicate it's an array we are deleting and then give them the name of the array. The problem being, if we just did delete PTR array, that would be interpreted as saying we want to delete the first element in the array and only the first element in the array. So if the array had 10,000 elements and we just did delete PTR array, we'll free up the first four bytes and the other 9,999 will still be reserved. So we have to remember to put in, um, uh, as part of the delete, the indication that is the full array that we want to, to free up. It's a source of problems. You can see down at the bottom, um, create an array of size 5, delete PTR data. Very easy to type in, very common to do. It'll compile, it'll run, it'll look okay. It's not going to cause any obvious um, downsides other than the fact we probably lost a chunk of memory. But again, over time, maybe we'll be running out of more memory. We've got to work out, oh, was this because of this or was this because of that? Line 3 shows the correct format for doing so. So it's something to be cautious about. Um, a little bit here, just, just a piece of advice. Given the duality between arrays and pointers, the most simple way to access the elements if you're dynamically creating an array is just to treat the pointer as if it is an array. Remember, well, in all programming languages, if we're under the surface to implement array, effectively it's pointer manipulation. You've got a pointer to the start and you're, you're indexing or offsetting it by a certain amount. In C++ in line one, if you get an integer pointer, you can just treat it as if it is an array. And you can do data three, for example, by doing so. Usual things apply, you want to make sure if you're not overshooting the bounds of the array and things like that. But it makes it more convenient uh, to use. Takeaways in this, uh, the new keyword provides a means of dynamically allocating large chunks of memory in the heap. Fair enough, that's what we use. The leak keyword gives us a way of freeing it up. Um, we've got to be careful about doing this here to make sure that we do pair these two things together. And as we saw in, in, in the talk, there's a few gotchas, if you like, if we're not careful uh, about how we go about doing this. But it does give us um, a good amount of flexibility in terms of deciding how we allocate things and, and how we free things up.